Hi, friends. Welcome back to our NBL Rewind series, where you get to revisit episodes that inspired us and we get to take a mental health break. I'm Danielle Van Hook from the Alden and McLean, Virginia, and I have the honor of introducing this week's episode. I'm going to take us back to episode 56, Sarah Margolis, Accessibility Isn't a Checklist. I have found myself going back to Sarah's interview over and over again as I think about what's actually important in my work and how I can make it more accessible to everyone. Sarah has such incredible experience and talks so eloquently about tangible ways that we can normalize access to disabled audiences, embed trauma-informed training, and lead those around us with respect first. To me, Sarah is a real inspiration to keep going in the work. And if I can be honest for a minute, After listening back with the gift of time, I'm so frustrated by my own commentary because I'm hearing more of what she had to say and realizing my own blind spots and interpretations. It's humbling. After you enjoy the episode, send it to a friend and spread the joy. We'll be back to you with new content in July. In the meantime, you can practice sounding out bus ness on your own. Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm Katie Miller with the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan, and I'm here with my best friends, Brian. Hey, Katie. Brian Zelmer from KU Presents in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Danielle. Oh, hi. It's Danielle Van Hook from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. Kevin. Oh, hey. Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts in Rock Island, Illinois. And last but not least, Josh. Josh Benson, rocking it from Marion, Illinois. I'm so excited to have our conversation with our guest, Sarah Margolis from TYA USA today. But before we get into that, I have a question that really directly relates to the conversation that Danielle and I had with Sarah um, as part of today's episode. So we talk a little bit about leadership with Sarah. And so I'm curious, what is a tenant of your leadership philosophy um, that you want to share with everyone today? I just try to exude awesomeness and then let that flow down from there. Kind of like the trickle down economy. Which also doesn't work. Yes. So there you go. <laughs> no, I for me it is to completely lead by example. And that comes that starts with attitude and how you approach things whenever anything comes to you. Um if you act like it's the end of the world when somebody's coming to you with an issue, then they're gonna think it is too. So leading with that edge of confidence, but quietness and calmness is is where I really settle in as my pathway through leadership. So I feel similarly to you, Josh. Um, I've been, you know, just quietness kind of- is part of yours. The trickle down part. (laughs) No, in a lot of my um, leadership roles that I've been lucky to have, I've been younger than a lot of the people that I was managing and sometimes not by a lot, but, you know, in a noticeable way. And I just knew walking into that situation, like the only way that I could really be a leader in that environment successfully and like right out of the gate was to treat everybody like they were a leader and to treat everybody like, you know, they were a professional and they knew what they were doing and I was there to support them. And when there was something that needed to be decided, I I listened to what people said. And um, the other thing that I like to do is not find the solution in writing over email or like Teams or text or anything is more of like pick up the phone and like just talk it through or walk upstairs and find the people or the person that we just sort of need to have the the conversation with and just talk it out because it's so much easier person to person than it is in writing. So much gets misinterpreted and it's just so much easier to meet somebody else where they are and to find a good path forward. For me, I just want to bring the humanness and treat everybody humanely and know that everybody has good days and bad days and make sure that I'm meeting them where they are, where they need to be met, and that I'm not talking down to people and that I'm listening. You know, listening is probably the most important part of my job as a manager. And I think that helps me be a leader is I'm I'm not just letting them talk and have space for that, but I'm truly listening to what they're saying and try to be there to support them in any way that I can. And that's my 
my primary objective is to make sure I'm supporting the people around me to be the best leaders that they can be. A main core of my leadership philosophy is that no leader is ever above or too good to do what needs to be done. So whether you're the CEO or you're a mid-level manager, you are never too good to lend a hand, especially in like an all hands on deck situation. If chairs need to be put out for an event, you can help put out the chairs. You can answer the phone. You can carry a case of water. You can help, you know, in whatever that case is, like I truly believe that no leader is ever too good or too high above to help out their team when it's really necessary. Of course, delegation is important and making sure people are doing what they need to do, but also like you need to be there for your team. And if you're not willing to do even small things to help the team succeed, um, then I don't really, for me, at least that is not true leadership isn't when you're not there for your team in their moment of need. Unless you're a union house, in which case, find out first if you can move those chairs or you'll get grievanced. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point, Brian. That's good advice. Absolutely. Uh, a core tenet of my leadership philosophy is really summed up pretty simply as give a shit. And that's literally about, you know, the way I approach like our, our job, like is to really care about what we're actually doing, but also with the team. I mean, like really care about what's going on with them, not just, you know, in the workplace, but sometimes it's outside of the workplace. Sometimes it's checking in to just see how they are doing um, to really care about them as as employees and as friends. I, I, th I think that, that that leads me down the path of, you know, making sure that the team's taken care of, making sure that we're focused on our mission as well. Well, thank you all for sharing your insights and a little bit about how you lead in your own organizations. And Danielle and I hope that you enjoy our conversation today with Sarah. I'm Sarah Morgulis. I'm the Executive Director of Theater for Young Audiences USA. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to There's No Business Like. We're so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Katie and Danielle. This is so fun. Yes. And my co-host today is the wonderful Danielle Van Hook. Hi, Danielle. Hello. hello. All right. So we have three TYA professionals on the pod today, which is like a little bit of a, of a dream for me. So I'm so excited to have this conversation. <laughs> So let's just start right away with um, your role as executive director of TYA USA. So just tell us a little bit about the organization and your role, and then we're going to get talking more about you and where you started. Theater for Young Audiences USA, TYA USA, is a nonprofit member service organization that represents over 1,200 theater makers in 47 states. And we support the field through professional development, fellowships and awards, as well as research and advocacy opportunities. And I took this role about a year and a half ago. Congratulations. Oh, Thank you. And how has it been since you came on board? It's been really amazing. I am very lucky that right after I started, we began these regional events in Seattle, Milwaukee, and Bethesda. So only a few months after taking my role, I was able to fly all over the U.S. and meet all of our members. And that was a really amazing way to transition into this role because immediately I got such a sense of what... TYA USA meant to all of our members and met so many new people. It was incredible. That's amazing. So we would actually love to hear a little bit more about how you got there. So your origin story, if you will. How did you start in the arts and how did that lead you to where you are today? I have loved TYA since I was a young person. I started out as a professional actor when I was a kid. I was at People's Light and Theater Company. I took uh, acting classes when I was little and totally got the acting bug and was in some shows as a young person, also took classes. I grew up outside of Philadelphia, so took classes at the Walnut Street Theater and the Wilma and the Arden and was really really grew up within the Philly theater scene. I went and got my BFA in acting at Syracuse University, had a wonderful time there, but studied abroad in London in my junior year and realized how accessible the arts can be. Arts education is so valued over in the UK. And it really opened my eyes to this whole other side of theater that I didn't know. So I was studying overseas at the globe as an actor. And during that time, realized I really wanted to get into theater education. 
So I came back to Syracuse in the spring semester of my junior year and took up all of these education courses, took up an education minor, started teaching and producing and directing. When I graduated Syracuse, I briefly lived in Sarasota, Florida and worked as the education intern at Oslo Repertory Theater and then moved to New York City to get my master's in applied theater at the City University of New York. That was just an extraordinary program. I met like my dearest colleagues who I still work with today and dearest friends. Since then, started working at New York City Children's Theater in their education department, started working for an organization called Action Play and getting really involved in the disability arts community. 10 years fast forward, worked at those places, grew my career as an accessibility and disability inclusion consultant and as a TYA producer. I, about a year and a half ago in the spring of 22, this job went up at TYA USA and I recognized that it was like such a perfect fit of all of my favorite things about my job at New York City Children's Theater. So it was building community through shared partnerships, advocating for theater for young people and the power of theater for young people, and that I could do it not only on a city level, but on a national level and have greater impact. That is how I got to where I am today. Wow, that is an incredible journey. I love the recognition of when you're overseas of like where your real passion lies and that you just dove right into additional training and figuring out what you needed to do right away to like pursue to that track. So was it a surprise to you when you realized that, that that was where your true passion lied and like how voraciously you you ended up going after that? I think there was always something inside of me that knew that I loved acting and that I was passionate about it, but that I wanted to do something a bit more. Like when I was a young person, I was acting, but I also was like a teaching assistant for classes and worked as a camp counselor at People's Light and loved, honestly, like working with other young people when I was a young person myself. And also when I was at Syracuse, I was really lucky because I had an amazing mentor named Loren, who was the director of education at Syracuse Stage. And she directed the children's tour, which I was in. And she sort of took me under her wing and taught me everything she could about TYA and theater ed while I was there. As you've worked in these different roles, bringing more accessibility to arts and ed and TYA USA, what are some cut and dry ways that you can make a theater program or any kind of arts programming more accessible? I would say the most important thing is to hire disabled consultants and to hire disabled colleagues to teach us because as a non-disabled person who works in the accessibility and disability inclusion field, I may have a lot of knowledge and have read a lot of books, but I don't have the lived experience of folks. I think the most important thing that we can do is to hire them and listen to them and make sure that we're working together in order to create work that is not only intended for disabled audiences, but work that is created by and like through the vision of disabled artists and colleagues. So in building those relationships and working with artists and administrators that have that lived experience, for those of us that are non-disabled or or don't have that, how do you go about building that relationship in a really genuine and authentic way and then use that to build out accessible programming for students of a variety of abilities and a variety of experiences? So it can't happen overnight. Accessibility isn't a checklist. The strongest relationships are made over time. So we hear a lot of theater saying, we offered an ASL interpreted performance and no deaf audiences came. Like our schools didn't come. And so I think recognizing that first, there it needs to happen in stages. First, there needs to be outreach to the, I'm using the deaf community as an example here. How can we first do some community outreach and do some arts and education programs in their schools? How can we develop relationships with those folks? How can we give ASL training to all of our teaching artists, whether or not they are working with deaf students? Like, How can we just normalize access and access tools and supports across the board first and give our staff the training? And then go out into the community, develop those relationships over time, and then in invite folks in? And how can we make sure that we've listened to them really carefully so that we've created accessible spaces for them to enter so that when they come in, they know exactly what to expect. It's not all new and overwhelming to them. 
At New York City Children's Theater, Aliza Greenberg was a consultant of ours. She came in and helped us develop a program that we did also with an artist named Miranda Lee in a usher training program. So we knew that we were doing these sensory friendly performances and we wanted to make sure that the ushers who were running that program themselves were neurodivergent. The young people and their families who were coming in and watching the sensory-friendly performances were also seeing representation of their community in the folks who were working at the program. And so that's an example of us hiring a disabled consultant to hire disabled ushers to work in a theater that was serving disabled audiences. So like, how can we really make sure that across the board, there's strong representation at each level? You use the word term neurodivergent, you use the term sensory friendly, we're talking about different layers of accessibility, doing outreach, that sort of thing. So what in your experience, what has changed in terms of the industry understanding of what accessibility means and how to create the art and programs? I don't know that I knew the term neurodivergent before 10 years ago. And as I've moved through my professional career, like this has been a whole world of learning for me personally and become a, a huge passion of mine, but it, it feels slow moving. In your experience, how has the industry understanding and implementation of accessibility shifted maybe over the last 10, 15 years? I love that you brought up language, Katie, because language is so fluid within the disability community. Fourth, right, that the most important thing you can do is listen to a disabled person of how they want to be identified. So some people identify as neurodivergent, others identify as disabled, some identify as a person with a disability and using that person first language instead of identity first. In terms of how the industry has shifted, and I I just sort of mentioned it previously, I think the biggest thing is the recognition that sensory-friendly performances are wonderful and making adaptations of the work. So something like TDF's sensory-friendly adaptations of Broadway shows where you can go see The Lion King on Thursday mornings and they do a sensory-friendly performance is fantastic. We can push the field to now create work that is intended for this audience from the ground up with that audience in mind. So the accessibility of it is a creative challenge from the very beginning um, and that we're not just creating a show and then thinking, oh, how can we make this accessible to our audiences, but actually recognizing from day one with the director, the actors, all the designers in the room, how can we make this accessible in its creation. Pushing that even forward, Ryan Haddad is a really phenomenal disabled artist. This is outside of the realm of TYA. He did this creative, beautiful show called Dark Disabled Stories that ran at the public last year. It was the most extraordinary example of access being baked into the performance. When we're creating work, can we think the audio description will be part of the show and the captions will be part of the show. The ASL interpretation will be part of the show. It will be represented on stage by all of the actors and that the access of it is beautiful. You know, how can we ensure that it's not something that we're just tacking on at the end, but that it is like actually aesthetically a really strong part of the show. And I'm very excited to see how we can, as TYA practitioners, make that part of the work. The National Disability Theater, which is now dissolved, did a really phenomenal TYA show called Emily Driver Takes the Wheel back at La Jolla Playhouse. They were working on creating accessibility as part of costume design, as part of the design of the show in a really exciting way. Yeah, I think that that is such a wonderful perspective and point about building in the connections to the disabled community within our own communities, as well as making sure that their access needs are within a part of our front of house processes, as well as our production and creation processes. So many of us say we're serving our whole community. And I think a lot of us truly mean that, but without making steps that are specifically for those that exist like outside of an atypical experience, mm -hmm. it's not inviting. We're not doing anybody any justice <laughs> um, by saying that it's for everyone when it's, you know, it's really not. So I want to 
actually dig a little bit deeper into an area of access, but in a different way. At the New York City Children's Theater, you were working in an after-school reading club program with children who were currently living in homeless shelters in New York City. I'd love to know a little bit just about what that program was and how it got started. The after-school reading club, which we called the ARC program, was this amazing partnership that we did within the Department of Education. When we started that program, we were hired because of the work that we had done with Literature at Play, which is a program that infuses the music and theater within literature curriculum, so ELA curriculum, Mm -hmm. in pre-K through fifth grades in New York City. We recognized the power of creating an after-school program in which we could go in each week with a book and use theater and music to explore that book in a 90-minute session with these students. Now, the challenge of that program was that it had to serve students pre-K through fifth grade. So it needed to be a book that could be adapted and tools that could be adapted for that humongous age range. Now, when we started this program, this was with 18 homeless shelters across the city. And by the time I left, we had expanded it to 36. It was an absolutely enormous part of my job. The incredible benefit of that program for our organization was that we partnered with trauma-informed therapists, social workers to advise on our trauma-informed curriculum that we gave our teaching artists. We knew when we received this program from the Department of Education, I knew that I did not have the training that I needed. We knew that we needed more training as administrators to run a trauma-informed workplace and that we had to give our teaching artists that training as well. Especially as we grew that program, we recognized, oh, wait, the training that we are giving our teaching artists is that modeling is now rubbing off on the Department of Education teachers that we are running that program with in these homeless shelters. Those are 72 teachers. There were two at each of the 36 sites that are now going back to 72 different schools in New York City, and they are sharing that curriculum. So the reach and the impact of the program was absolutely enormous. It was my favorite program I ever ran at New York City Children's Theater. And the work was so beautiful and outstanding because it wasn't tied to a product. We weren't creating a big musical at the end. It was on Fridays. Every Mm -hmm. Friday, we would go run this programming at these sites because it's transitional housing. Sometimes these students were there for six months. Sometimes we only saw them for a week, but we were seeing them at this really important moment in their lives and providing them with just unbridled joy every Friday. We had so much fun. And we also ran that program as a summer camp in the summers, which was incredibly important for that population. And so we were thrilled to be able to go in and work with them during that time. And really outstanding relationships developed between our teaching artists and the young people that they served, Mm -hmm. and also the teachers and the support staff at those sites. Mm -hmm. That program still runs, not under that same name, but New York City Children's Theater still does an outstanding amount of work in transitional housing shelters all across New York City, especially with the new migrant population that has come in to the city. Our bilingual work and our multilingual work with those populations is more important than ever. First of all, I after reading about the that program in prepping for this, you know, conversation today, I was blown away by the scale and the scope and the work you're done you did with that and it continues to happen. So just I think that it's an incredible example of like how the arts can be embedded in other areas of life. So my two follow-up questions. One is about training. I think a lot of us have an idea of like the importance of trauma-informed work, but we don't necessarily have the resources or the wherewithal or go, oh, we can just figure it out as we go along. So one, why is it important to receive specific training for teaching artists or administrators in that specific area? And then two, I think some people would argue that the arts are maybe an unnecessary thing to bring to students in transitional housing situations because they're dealing with so much. So why work with that particular group of children during that moment in their lives? And like you mentioned the joy and the and the fun that you had, but like what is the deeper impact of arts programming in that specific moment when they're dealing with really and so much at that moment in their in their lives? These are big questions. And I have I have big answers. <laughs> I love them. 
They're so fantastic, Katie. Um, well, first of all, I have an incredible resource for the people who want to know more about trauma-informed training. During my final months at New York City Children's Theater, and when I was six months pregnant, I, I helped to film a toolkit that we did for training other folks in trauma-informed care. And that is all at traumainformedtoolkit.org. In terms of trauma-informed teaching, the basis of it is recognizing that most people in a room have experienced one traumatic thing or another and that we can always just assume that when we are work when we are walking into a classroom that some student has experienced some level of trauma and with that in mind it is incredibly important for us to be looking at things through a trauma informed perspective trauma can look so different in young people it can be the young person who is the loudest and running around and bouncing off the walls, or it can look like the really, really shy, quiet, perfectly behaved student in the front of the classroom. In terms of why it's important to be using a trauma-informed perspective with these specific young people in the ARC program, the most important part of literature at play for these students was the social-emotional learning. To be able to name for students the emotions that they are experiencing, give them the tools to breathe, identify their emotions, the important distinction here is not manage their emotions. It's not a man, it's not emotional management, but it is giving them the tools to feel and identify and I would say like work through their emotions. So there's nothing wrong with crying. There's nothing wrong with yelling if you need to yell, but knowing how to work through those emotions and identify what's going on in your body. We did a lot of breathing exercises with them and a lot of pared down yoga with them so that they could sort of find their breath in their bodies felt really important. And in terms of the social emotional work, giving them the aesthetic distance in applied theater, we talk a lot about aesthetic distance. So if I am experiencing something really sad and hard in my life, and I read a book about a young person that's experiencing something really sad and hard, and I get to get up and act like that character and work through that character's challenge on my own, that's going to give me perspective of how to make that change in my own life. We say, Augusta Boal says something like that in theater, we can rehearse for life. So we're rehearsing for our own future. Pre-pandemic, the New Victory Theater did this incredible study, I believe it was with Wolf Brown, and they found these results that theater supports young people in dreaming for the future and hoping for the future. Our work in the ARC program and at literature play in general gave students an aesthetic distance from what they were experiencing at home. I also just want to name really clearly that not all of the young people would have identified their lives as hard or bad. There is an assumption there as people who aren't experiencing transitional housing that families in transitional housing must be having a horrible time when actually a lot of the young people that we met were housed. Like they were, they did have a room upstairs that was safe and that was warm and was with their families and they didn't think that they were experiencing anything hard. Now, their parents may have been having a different situation, but I talk about the joy of that program because a lot of those young people were so relieved and thrilled to be at that site and were in community with other kids and their families were safe. We worked a lot in domestic violence. Sorry, we're like getting really deep now. And I will put a trigger warning on this, that we worked in a lot of domestic violence shelters. And so we worked with a lot of mothers and young children who were escaping violent households. The fact that they were at that site in that care and with us every Friday meant that they were now in a safe environment. So the fact that we were able to witness that joy, that relief, that freedom was truly outstanding. Yes, yeah, Sarah, I think that story is so important to tell because as adults and as people that like see themselves as educated, we make really big assumptions mm -hmm. and we want to just sort of be able to fix it from, you know, a programmatic perspective or somebody who wants to be a funder. It's like, well, let's just give it money and that right. will help. But hearing somebody right. like you who's been working incrementally to make those kind of achievements, I think it's such an important story to communicate because it shows us 
are false assumptions and that there is a path forward. It's not just all bad, that there is joy embedded in all of this, that working with people on a human level, treating them like humans is a lot of ways what the arts does. But it's just such an important thing to really drive home, like whenever we are trying to get grants and we are trying to do the nuts and bolts of putting these kind of programs together. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think it's going to be really important for a lot of people. And I can see sort of the three of us here who are all TYA professionals just kind of sitting in the empathy that I think we feel in hearing stories like that. And I think TYA kind of embraces us, <laughs> uh, people sort of that have kind of empathy first, navigate towards this um, this profession, but that can also bring up a lot of things for us and just make doing the work hard to get up and do every day, even mm. though you love it so much. And so I'm wondering, like, what have you done or what have you done with the teams that you've managed to help manage or like work with the feelings that this kind of program can bring up with people to make it a safe space for those who are working? I'm so glad you brought that up, Danielle. A lot of the trauma-informed curriculum is talking about secondary trauma and vicarious trauma. Speaking really clearly and directly to the reality of that in this work to prepare teaching artists for that. We also, when setting up this program, created lots of different networks and ways for teaching artists to connect with each other. Things like Facebook groups, email threads, in-person meetups, so that teaching artists could talk about about what they were seeing, thinking, feeling. I think teaching artistry in general, no matter what the site are can be a really isolating profession. If you're not co-teaching and you're going out by yourself into the work, you're going out to a school, you know, teaching five classes, coming home, going to a homeless shelter, teaching three classes, going home and not connecting with anyone on a day-to-day -day basis. So really important more than ever to create community among teaching artists in really strong ways. That was very much and remains to be a bedrock of the program. Sarah, I... Thank you for sharing that too. I don't know that as uh, administration professionals, we think a lot about teaching artists in that way and how to create safe spaces for them and how to support them because it's like, we're hiring you for a job. You're going to go in, you're going to teach, you're going to do the thing, right? But I think that's, those are all really important things for us to think about as we start or continue to or start growing new education initiatives, especially coming out of the pandemic because it added like a whole new layer to what that experience for teaching artists and students and co-teachers would be. So thank you for bringing some mm -hmm. of those things to the table. Yeah, and we and can't so, praise teaching artists enough. No, oh. they deserve all the money. Yeah. <laughs> all the They're money. Phenomenal. <laughs> and I, phenomenal. I will also say, Katie, because you mentioned, you know, sort of as managers, what we can do. But I remember writing like a, a silly blog post on this for New York City Children's Theater's like website or blog at some point. We also, when we are running programs like that, we need to have a trauma-informed workplace too. And talking about what that means also feels really useful. So like I was the fiercest advocate for my teaching artists had to stick up for them, make calls for them, do whatever in order for them to go out and do their best work. And I think that that was also a really important part of my job as well, that Yes, of course, we are supporting the students, but also the teaching artists need to feel supported, uplifted, empowered, and valued, underline capital V, to do their best work as well. Let's move a little bit forward in your history and let's dive a little bit more into your current role with TYA USA. Um, so can you tell us just briefly about the history and purpose of the organization and the shift that has been made, I would say, over the, like the last three years to bringing more cohesiveness between the producing side of the TYA industry and the presenting side of the TYA industry? TYA USA was started in 1965. It was, it started as part of the Asatej Network, which is this extraordinary network all across the world of children's theater associations. Um, so there is one in every country in the world, and we are the one in the United States. Um, we rebranded as TYA USA. I will say in the last few years, there has been this extraordinary influx of presenters as members of our member service organization. And that is thanks very much and due to Jonathan Schmidt Chapman, my predecessor, who came from presenting organizations like New Victory Theater, Lincoln Center, and recognized the importance of bringing those folks into our membership. We run monthly Zoom affinity calls. And one of my very favorite calls is with you both, 
as um, presenters on that call. And it's such an extraordinary moment for me and my own learning curve in this position, because I do not have experience with presenters. You all have taught me an amazing amount about that world. And I think that This is such a crucial moment, not only in TYA, but in the theater field to recover from the pandemic, recover our audiences and figure out how to move forward. It is so important that the presenting houses and the producing houses are talking to one another because so many of us have really similar problems going on. And so... One of my favorite parts of my job is, can, is, as I said earlier, community and connecting people. So a lot of my job is recognizing like, oh, Danielle had this question and it reminded me of something that someone was talking about in the producing call. So actually, I'm going to connect you to like, I just did that for a group of people this week. I love that part of my work because I believe in the strength of our field. Mm -hmm. supporting one another. I think up to this point in our conversation, you've been pretty humble about your role in the TYA USA universe and the role that you have is a massive job and it's so important. In order to do it, you have to be a really strong leader. And I'm curious about what your leadership philosophy is um, and how you work like within your own organization, your board, people outside of that organization that get so much from it and especially everyone's working remotely. So I'd love to just get some insight into you as a leader. Trying to remember who said this quote, and I'm going to Google it after this, but I read it recently and I really resonated with it. And the advice was to treat everyone like a leader. The assumption that I make when I lead is that everyone's voice and opinion is really important, especially coming into this role with so much legacy. There are members of TYUSA who have been members for like 30 or 40 years, have been to every conference, answering your question in a roundabout way, but especially in this role, I wanted to spend my first year really listening to what the individual needs were, to what the field needed, kind of filling in the gaps with my own creativity. Like we, in Applied Theater, we talk about the creative gaps. Like what are the moments that you see a way in? Certainly with things like the fellowship. I didn't want to just dive in and relaunch it in 2022, right when I arrived. And I wanted to wait and learn from the field and, you know, have some think tanks and hear from people what really resonated with them and go into the archive and then look at it from my own perspective. And I will say my board is really extraordinary in holding on to what they think is important in terms of the legacy of TYA, but also really allowing me to bring in my own viewpoint and move things forward and push us into the future with my own experience and my skills. In terms of leading, I say to everyone, like, follow your own passion, follow your own curiosity, and you will do your best work. I definitely try to do that in this role. So go with my gut instinct in terms of what I think the field needs and also what I'm most passionate about, what I'm most curious about. I certainly do that in terms of picking programming for the conference and bringing up topics in our affinity groups. I do believe that our members really need this organization. I believe so strongly in the value of it. If I lead with that passion, then it will bring me to the right place. I believe really strongly in mentors. I Oh, that's actually like the best answer for how do I lead is I... And that is very related to like treat everyone like a leader. But I love mentoring. Like I love listening really closely to what... I mean, we'll use Stephen and Rachel as examples because they're the folks I work with every day. Really leading and figuring out their workflow based on what they love to do and their favorite parts of their job. And, you know, like in their reviews, I ask them, like, what don't you want to do? What do you want to take off of your list? How can we redo sort of our workflow so that you are able to do your favorite work and your best work every day? So looking at how we can just make sure that everyone is is doing their best work because they are leading with their own passions. I think that's super smart advice for all leaders, all supervisors, all mentors, because I think we get caught up in the day to day and like, this is the list of things that have to be done. But asking those really thoughtful questions, I think is a really great piece of advice. So thank you for sharing Mm -hmm. that. 
you mentioned that your TYA USA membership has been, some people have been part for 30, 40 years and members need this organization. So let's talk for a second about sustainability and the business model of a, a national service membership organization. So very briefly, can you just give us the rundown of what is that revenue model and how do you keep an organization like this sustainable for the future? The revenue model is everyone's membership dues and registration for programming, as well as sponsorship for things like the newsletter and the programming, the conference, the regional event, as well as individual donations, foundation support, and government support. Coming into this role sort of ran on the platform of financial accessibility for our members. So I came in and I lowered registration rates for our conference. I looked at expanding the scholarship model. What I need to do as an executive director is figure out how to balance that. If we are doing that, then what are the ways that we are making it up in the rest of the field? So if the burden is not so much on the members, we need to bring in more foundation support. We need to bring in more government support, et cetera, et cetera. That accessibility conversation, it, we don't have time for it today, but we should have that at some point in time about sure. accessibility and pricing across whether it's dues, conference registration, ticket pricing, like that's a that's a whole thing. But I appreciate your thoughtfulness towards that, especially in this moment of financial and economic strain for organizations and individuals. So Absolutely. thank you for being thoughtful about that. Um, So Sarah, on this podcast, we have access to a time machine. We'd love to take all our guests back into. If you'll come with us, we'd love to borrow that machine and take you back to when you're getting back into Syracuse, into your undergraduate after being in the UK. And what advice would you give yourself or what do you wish you had known then that you know now? You don't need to know all the answers and you're going to meet the people who will teach you and who you can collaborate with and who will inspire you. I have like a very strong Capricorn self that just wants to do it all myself and know it all and figure it all out. Sometimes that leads to me like having trouble asking for help, just wanting to take care of things. And I think that especially in the last few years, and especially during the pandemic, I learned to, well, I don't know if I just learned it, but I've learned it certainly since I was 22 or 20 that I have all of the support that I need. I have the time that I need. So this is a final question. We ask this of all of our guests. We've, oh my gosh, we've covered so much ground today. I mean, you had such an incredible career, Sarah, and I've so enjoyed learning more about it. But what do you like most about working in the performing arts industry today? I like that we're still doing it. (laughs) I like that, like in the pandemic, it could have all come crashing down and it did come crashing down that we're back and that people are still doing the work. And yes, like folks got burnt out, still are burnt out, are figuring out how to take care of themselves, but that there is nothing, we come back to it because there's nothing like it. Like I went to a production of Fat Ham recently before it closed and experienced the most intense joy in the theater. The whole audience was up and dancing and yelling and screaming and that there is nothing like that feeling. And I love doing it right now personally, because there's nothing like bringing my son to the theater. I took him to go see Spellbound Theater's Shakespeare Stars at New Victory this spring, and he loved it. During the show, they, they were the most incredible actors. Actually, Jody from Spellbound Theater wrote an article for TYA Today that comes out in half an hour. <gasps> and she was in this production of Shakespeare Stars that I took Hunter to. Hunter's my two-year-old. We were sitting... Uh, in sort of like the bubble of Shakespeare stars. And she came over and this is towards the end of the show. She put an invisible star in his pocket. She said, star, putting a star in your pocket and you can give it to your mom later. And then we were on the way home on the New Jersey transit bus. And he looked at me and he pointed to his pocket and he, he patted it. And he said, star. He didn't have very much language at that time. This was when he was like just, you know, a year and a half. And it was so powerful because Mm -hmm. that was like our post-show talk back. (laughs) (laughs) But he remembered that the the actress had put this invisible thing in his pocket and he took him home. He took it home with himself. 
the power of theater had transcended outside of the theater space and onto the bus and was in his little mind. And so he was like taking this little piece of magic home with him. And so who knows if he'll grow up to be an actor or even work in the theater. But the fact that I get to share the magic of theater with him and experience it as a parent through totally new eyes is really phenomenal. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Danielle, for being a part of this conversation. It is such a joy to share space with you, Sarah, and you, Danielle, like these, my friends and phenomenal women. Um, It's been such a joy to have this conversation. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. This was such a treat. Katie and Danielle, thanks for introducing us to Sarah. I really enjoyed hearing more about TYA, which you both know I'm starting to delve into that world in my series. But I particularly liked hearing about the story about the after school program in New York City. Um, And I loved how she was focusing on the joy of the children. You know, a lot of times in those situations, she's right, we kind of, and like Danielle said, we want to just throw money at it and quickly help the problem. But But I loved that approach about thinking, oh, yeah, well, the children feel safe. They're with other kids. They're having a good time. They're not always having the same kind of burdens that the parents are probably feeling. And and just focusing on that joy was was just a a really interesting way to to think about that and hear about that. Yeah, I really loved hearing about all of the past programs that she's worked on and how her training in applied theater, which is possibly one of my favorite terms right now is applied theater, because that's cool as heck. She has all of that experience that she's bringing with her into this position, how that can translate to the members and she can exude that confidence as a leader because of everything that she's done up until now. Yeah. And one of the things I'm most excited about, hopefully coming to be a little bit more mainstream in the TYA world and hopefully just in the theater world in general, is the idea about embedding that access into the design of a show and, you know, making it a part of the aesthetic. A lot of the sign language and the audio interpretations, they're just different ways of communicating. And so, of course, that fits in to live theater. To your point, like, that is a a new frontier, perhaps, or a new way of thinking about it. It's going to take a while for the industry, I think, to shift. But there have been really positive steps made in that direction. And it's really exciting to think about that. One of my favorite programs that she talked about was whenever they were bringing in neurodivergent individuals to be the ushers for the accessible series so that the attendees that were neurodivergent weren't just seeing it on stage or there in an accessible way. They were literally seeing people in real life functioning and being part of their experience. And I think that is so incredibly important and beautiful. Katie, you mentioned how neurodivergency has kind of come up sort of as a new topic in our field for the last 10 years. And honestly, it's only, it's been a new word for me for the last four years. And in all transparency, I've actually been part of the neurodivergent community. I was diagnosed in 1993 without even knowing that word. So I'm learning about it myself, even though I'm part of that community. Brian, to your point and Sarah's point about language, it is fluid and it's changing all the time and being neurotypical or neurodivergent. And those are just not words that were used in in general conversation in society until pretty recently. Like sensory friendly performances and adaptations like that have been around in our industry for 15, almost 20 years now. But that was a very small part of the field. It's interesting how long it takes for language to really become established. Um, a quick Google says that neurodiversity was first used in 1998 as a, as a medical term. For it to become part of the common lexicon, it, it's taken 25 years so far. But 25 years for that terminology to really become part of everyday communication and language. While it's within the lexicon now, there are still a lot of people that just don't understand what it means. They They've heard it, but they they don't know exactly what it means. Part of that comes with acceptance, people being more accepting in our industry, as well as just, you know, a broader society and be more understanding of people's needs. And so being able to address people properly, you know, that change in language does take time, but also like kudos to those folks who have been doing this for for that long to, you know, continue to sort of push for that change and fight for that change. I think one of the greatest things that Sarah said in the interview is talking about, you know, look at the consultants that you hire and, you know, people that you're working with, because when you are able to, you know, expand upon that and, you know, hiring people like in 
in the disability community. I mean, you can really grow your programs. You're getting a different insight. You're getting that lived experience to actually change what you're doing in your organization and in your community. I just want to highlight what something Sarah said about the amount of time and effort it takes to build out accessibility initiatives. Um, In addition to not only just baking it into your programming, you have to bake it into your relationship building as well. And you can't just do it once and expect people to show up. Um, So that's communications, that's marketing, that is engagement, that's relationship building. And I really want people to, to think seriously about as you're building the infrastructure, also building the relationships because it's trust. For so many years, we have not offered any sort of accessibility, whether it's physical facility accessibility or programming accessibility. And so I think a crux or a key of that is really building trust between audiences that have not been welcomed in in any way, shape or form or really had true access in the past. Um, it's building that trust back up. So I just want to really highlight that again. Um, I don't know that Sarah used that word trust, but I feel like that's a really important part of this conversation. Yeah. And she talked about the fact that like, you know, the, the comments that get made about, you know, oh, we did ASL at, at this performance and nobody showed up. And I sort of want to think about that differently as what's the harm? Like, what's the problem if it was there and nobody actually, you know, necessarily like used it? Like, it was it, it? It's not distracting to a performance. And I will say that I once did see a performance that incorporated sign language into the entire thing. So the the interpreter was part of the production, and it was one of the coolest things that I had seen. Um, I don't obviously speak that um, or need that, but it was really cool to see that incorporated into something because it just. It felt like the director and the writer of that show was just had a hand out and was trying to invite people in by just incorporating that in and not going, oh, if you want to see this, like you need to come to the two o'clock performance because that's the only time we're going to have this. It just felt welcoming. And I think there's a little bit of tension between resources because it costs money to build accessibility into into existing programming to make those changes or bring in an interpreter or do closed captioning or whatever, for instance, just as examples. But so there's a tension between resources and how many, how much people power and and time and money that takes. Um, And then to Sarah's point about baking it in inherently, so you can make that a part of what you're doing from the get go. But I think that's why one of the reasons a lot of organizations have not moved as quickly as they could in providing accessibility accommodations is because it takes a lot of thoughtful time and energy to make it and relationship building and conversation, again, to make those things truly work. Like Danielle said, we're not doing justice for anybody when we do it half-assed or we don't do it at all or we do it poorly. You know, too, and I think when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about equity and we're talking about all of the other conversations that we've had here around equity. And to your point, Katie, like when we're building the infrastructure for a group that we want to welcome into our space and we want to make sure we're recognizing for our community, we're building space then for those other communities as well. So just because you maybe want to spend this year making your space more accessible, that doesn't mean that you're ignoring other groups that maybe have been historically not welcomed into your space. But getting your staff through a process of recognizing where there's maybe harm being done to um, an audience coming into the space or where there's a way that you can create equity by providing extra opportunities for one group rather than another. You're laying the groundwork for the equity to take place for all of the other groups as well. And it's just really important, um, like we talked about in the language, asking people how they want to be described. That language is fluid and getting used to being comfortable with fluid language is is just going to help us invite everyone into our spaces and make them comfortable and supportive and loving and joyful for all of the people in our community. I also want to thank Sarah for telling that story about bringing her son to, to the new Vic to see the show. It, it brought a lot of nostalgic, warm feelings to my heart because I remember bringing my kids into the city. We would take the train, not the bus, but we would take the train in and and I often would bring one of them with me to scout a, a kid's show or something like that. And and I, I miss those days. So, that, you know, that was just really heartwarming. Well, thank you all for being here with Danielle and I today. What a wonderful conversation with Sarah. And we are just so grateful for her time and energy and all the work that she is doing to help lead the theater for young audience as part of our industry forward. So thanks again for being here with us on There's No Business Like, and we'll see you next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, 
Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hope. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? (laughs) I got it. Don't worry. It is nobusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus i every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. And I am here with my best friend. No. And I'm here with my good friends, Brian. Ouch. Demoted. Yeah. Ow. <laughs> best friend. Like, oh, be just, okay, oh. friend. I'll, I'll let myself out now. <laughs> my most okayest friend. <laughs> my best friend. No. <laughs> Too far. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Nice to see you. <laughs> Brian from KU Presents. It's okay. Nobody likes me anyway. It's <laughs> really good. That's funny. I feel like um, most employees or, or subordinates are um, motivated by money and everybody has their price. So after I go to a staff member, I always make sure when I'm done talking with them, I pull a coin from their ear. Sometimes depending on who it is, it could be a quarter, maybe a dime, nickel, um, you know, and, and that seems to do the trick and they all seem to be wowed by it. And, and that motivates them to do good work. I, I, why is everyone laughing? Um, it's, 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 I mean, I usually have to do dollars. I'm surprised that you can pull coins. Yeah, I was like, this is a really good way to like show your team their worth. Like, oh, oh, just a penny today. Yeah, I really need to step up your game. Get to that half dollar. See, Kevin gets it. It's a good motivational tool. Kevin, hold on one second. Do I need to? There you go. This is for you. <laughs> you I'm a dime today. That's a quarter. It looks wow. more like a That's nickel. A oh, is it a quarter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Quarter. Oh. It's Aww, a quarter. you're worth a quarter. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Is it pronounced Taya? Yeah, it's Taya. T y a u s a. Taya. It's Taya for short. Is that no. what everyone says? Taya, no. Taya, Taya Usa. No. Yeah. So my favorite thing about your Tayusa conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you guys thought I was serious for a second. I knew exactly where you were going. How long it takes to build these relationships. What oh, nothing. Go ahead. I was I was just saying good job, Kevin. <laughs> you drop it down. Wait, did yeah. you pull another quarter out of your ear? Oh. That's not where he pulled it out of. <laughs> so stupid. I love it so much. Yay, TYA. Tayusa. <laughs>